Hello and welcome to State of the Union. I'm Stefan Grobe in Brussels. Donald Trump is angry these days. First, he lost the election, and now the United States won't finish first in the global vaccine race. Even more humiliating for him, he lost to Europe. Well, kind of, to Britain. This week, the United Kingdom became the first Western country to authorize a coronavirus vaccine, with shots from U.S. pharma giant Pfizer and its German partner, BioNTech. Preparations are underway to start rolling out millions of doses, first to health workers and the elderly, the groups being prioritized on Monday. Prime Minister Boris Johnson, who is facing heavy intra-party opposition because of his lockdown measures, urged people not to get carried away with optimism just yet. Being the first also means being in uncharted waters. I think it is very important at this stage for us all to recognise that this is uh, unquestionably good news. It's very, very good news. But it is by no means the end of the story. It is not the end of our national uh, struggle against, uh, against coronavirus. In the meantime, Europe is grappling with tens of thousands of new infections every day and thousands of deaths. Former French President Valérie Giscard d'Estaing being one of them. Right now, it seems like the EU will get vaccinations faster than relief funds. The money is there, but Poland and Hungary are blocking final approval because the EU is about to introduce the respect of the rule of law as a condition for receiving funds. The frustration of EU leaders at both Eastern member states is growing. But if someone does have legal doubts, there is a very clear path. They can go to the European Court of Justice. This is the place where we usually trash our differences of opinion regarding legal tests and not at the expense of millions of Europeans who are desperately waiting for our help because we are amidst a deep, deep crisis. The other side feels frustration as well. In Poland, there is increasing anti-EU sentiment being voiced by government backers. It's time to recognize that the EU and its liberal values is not the perfect fit for Poland, these voices say. And all of a sudden, a word with an unambiguous meaning has penetrated the debate about Poland's future, Polexit. Joining me now is Tomasz Bielecki, Brussels correspondent of Warsaw-based Gazeta Wyborcza, one of the leading newspapers in Poland. Welcome to the program. Hello, welcome. So, opposition leaders have warned that the government's rhetoric could lead to a Polish exit from the EU, which the deputy foreign minister has described as political fiction. How serious is this talk about Polexit? I think it's a bit exaggerated. There's no doubt that the tone of Polish debates on the EU, also debate in the state, uh, state mass media, pro-governmental pro media, is more and more similar or more and more closer to the uh, British conversations years before uh, Brexit, but I'd say decades before the Brexit. So I, I have no doubt that in the mid-term and long-term, uh, the today's situation and the, uh, and, uh, the tone of debate on, on EU in Poland is risky, but it's not the matter of, uh, of, of the uh, five or six, seven years uh, from now. So yes, for exit is, Yes, it's a risk for, for, the, for, for the far future, but it's not the imminent risk. Suppose Poland left the EU. How would the country do alone in a world without Trump? Yeah, it would be a very gloomy future of Poland uh, uh, outside of the, of the EU. Of course, uh, this uh, Polish-American alliance uh, is very strong, but it's very asymmetrical. Yes, obviously, America is far more important for Poland and not vice versa. Uh, so to, to, to have the, the, the U.S. as a, as a f very close but far ally is, is, is vital for Poland. So it would be suicidal to, to, to leave the, the, the Western structures. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but the Polish government doesn't seem to like the EU, its institutions, its officials and its liberal values. Why would they want to stay? Yeah, for now it's very simple. There is a very simple explanation that yes, the government the government uh, is using this eurosceptic rhetoric. They are very eurosceptic or anti-EU circles in the government. They are, they are also more pro-EU circles, uh, but uh, nevertheless, more than eighty percent of uh, of polls in opinion polls 
in recent years, from the very beginning of, of, the, of the Polish membership in the EU, more than 80% of Poles support Polish membership in, in the EU. It's eight, more than 80% is because of geography, because of the cultural aspirations of being the part of the West, and it's also because of the funds, uh, very generous uh, uh, programs financed by the EU, EU money, uh, very important for the Polish rural uh, areas, for the Polish industry, for the Polish uh, local governments. All right, very interesting, Tomasz, uh, Tomasz Bielecki, Brussels correspondent of Gazeta Wyborcza. Thank you so much for being on. Thank you very much. As the Polish government struggles to come to terms with reality, its companion, the ruling party in Hungary, had its own problems. This week, the nationalist Fidesz of Prime Minister Viktor Orban had to realize the hard way that their reactionary views of society are out of sync even with their own members. The Fidesz MEP close to Orban, Josef Sayer, was caught in a private gay sex party in downtown Brussels. In liberal Belgium, such a get-together of more than 20 consenting men is not illegal. But breaking the coronavirus lockdown rules is. That is now Sayer's personal problem. But what makes it a political scandal is the hypocrisy on display here. Chaya, author of anti-LGBT legislation, is denying his fellow Hungarians what he himself was using for personal pleasure, the tolerance of the law. Maybe it's time for Fidesz as well to figure out whether the European Union is their right place to be. That's it for this edition. I'm Stefan Grober. Thank you for watching. Have a good week.